one of my uh, habits, as you have already you know, is I, I love to take a book of the Bible and systematically move through it and to teach it section by section. And one of the reasons I do that is because when I became a Christian, the pastor who was pastoring the church where I came to know the Lord did just that. He was preaching out of the book of Galatians. And I showed up one Sunday with a few other guys, uh, raised as a pretty nice Lutheran. Uh, you know, with you know, I had my idiosyncrasies as well, and had my little habits of wandering off and doing things that were mischievous and maybe beyond that a little bit, but nothing really, really bad. But then I heard the gospel as he was starting a series out of the book of Galatians, and he was just preaching through the text of Scripture, and it made an impact on me. So I have always found that by taking a book of the Bible and what we call as expositional preaching, you move through it, it has the greatest possible impact over a period of time, you get the sense of what that book is teaching. And I believe that explaining Scripture oftentimes is enough just to have a powerful impact. Now I say that because there are some pastors and preachers and people over the years who have taught, even I've been addressed on this, is that I should spend at least half the message in what they would say application and less on explanation. And I would disagree with that. Uh, I would say that the focus needs to be on the explanation of Scripture to cross-reference it, to explain it. And when you do that, oftentimes the application is just obvious. It is absolutely obvious to the listener. Today, there's a lot of application that takes place in pulpits without giving a full and clear and precise explanation. You do not want to have application without explanation. And there's a difference there. And so we're finishing up the book of the Revelation, and actually today the entire message almost will come across as an application. It's also an explanation. Because John, in our particular text today, which Sheila has already read, will show the impact of, of receiving the book of Revelation. It gives us the impact that will affect our lives. In fact, I would say the goal of the book of Revelation is to reveal Christ. The goal of the book of Revelation is to exalt the person of Jesus Christ and to impact us, his followers, to reach out to the unsaved with the things that we find in this book and to, to appeal to them to repent and believe that if the book of Revelation is true, and it is, then there's some stupendous things that are going to happen in the future. If you don't believe the book of Revelation, you think, ah, oh, that's just a bunch of just, uh, you know, the imaginations of some old man who penned this down many, many years ago, then, then you're not going to have the sense, the impact of what's intended by the book of Revelation. There are practical results of, of taking in this book. It's not fictitious. It's not fairyland stuff. It's not pie in the sky. It is truth that is made available to us to impact us and those around us, especially those who do not know Jesus Christ. And so today, how Revelation should impact the Christian. And we got six points, uh, and I've already shared this. The goal of Revelation is to reveal Christ with the impact of causing his followers to reach out to the unsaved and the unsaved to repent and follow Christ. So we got six points there in your outline there in your bulletin. If you want to write down and fill in the blank um, as we go through this, that would be great on how the book of Revelation should impact, impact us. The first one is to build our confidence, to build our confidence in what we call the imminence of Christ's return. Now that's a tricky word because there's another word just like it that means something totally different. When we speak of the eminence, maybe you've never heard of this word. The eminence, something that is imminent, means it's like it's ready to happen. If I'd say the tornado, the, there's a tornado that's going to 
that's going to hit us imminently, or the imminence of a coming tornado is is upon us. It's something that is is going to happen very quickly. So the so the book of Revelation is to give us confidence in the in the soon return, the eminence of Christ's return. And you know, as we've already talked about, he actually there was a song that one of those songs we sang this morning talked about the prophets and uh, how God has given us all this prophecy. We go back and we read through our Bibles and we see all the prophecies in the Old Testament regarding the first coming of Christ. And you can go back and study how all those things, all those prophets, or all those prophecies rather, came exactly true as were foretold. And again, one of my favorite passages on prophecy is Isaiah chapter 53, where it says of Christ, uh, where Isaiah writes, uh, he was speaking of Christ, he was despised and forsaken of man, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He goes on to say, surely our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows he carried. Uh, He was pierced through for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. When you read Isaiah 53, it's like you're reading a gospel account of the death of Christ. And yet Isaiah was Isaiah 53 was written 700 years before the death of Christ. And it's just as that was accurate in every detail, and we can look back and say, wow. We can look at the, we're going to someday look back on events as they transpire and say, you know what, the book of Revelation was absolutely true and absolutely sure. And so the book of Revelation, first of all, is to is given to us to build our confidence specifically in the imminence of Christ's return. Go back to Revelation chapter 1, verse 3, a passage that we looked at many, many, many months ago now. Revelation 1, 3, Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things that are written in it, for the time is near. So, there's even back at the very beginning, we're told that there's a blessedness to those who read and to those who heed the things of this book. Now, letter A there under your in your notes there is we find, first of all, and we've already alluded to this, the confidence in the revelation. The confidence in the revelation. In other words, the angel, go go to your text in Isaiah, or excuse me, Revelation chapter 22, verse, verse 6. It says this, it says, And he said to me, these words are faithful and true. These words are faithful. That's what the angel said to John. There's sort of, there is a heavenly attestation that the prophecies are authentic and they're true. And John provides his commentary. He goes on to say, and the Lord, in verse 6, he says, and the Lord, the God of of the spirits of the prophets sent his angel to show his bond servants the things which must shortly take place. Uh, John is is seeing the reality of this book. He's confident that the things that the angel has shown him are true. Back in Isaiah, you might want to write this reference down, Isaiah chapter 46, verses 9 through 11. I'll just give you the gist of it. God says, I make known the end from the beginning from ancient times, what is still to, to come, my purpose will stand, he says in Isaiah 46, 9 through 11. The book of Revelation is worthy of our obedience because its truth is established. Because forgers, fakes, don't write books that exalt the person of Christ. They don't write books that exalt his judgment and his wrath. Men write books that will give ideas and pictures of fake Jesuses or fictitious Jesuses, but not the kind of Jesus that comes and judges sin as you see in the book of Revelation. This book is so accurate that, uh, again, back in chapter 1 of Revelation, John writes, he says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him. 
to show us his servants the things which must shortly come to pass. Okay? So if God says, as he does in the book of Revelation, that there's going to be giant hailstones that's going to pound the earth, guess what? There are going to be giant hailstones that pound the earth. If God says that there's going to be blood of men who have been killed that spans over 200 miles, then that's what's going to happen. If God says fire is going to scorch the earth, it's going to be. If God says a third of the rivers are going to be turned to rotten and sour and polluted, it's going to be. If God says the sea is going to have the same thing happen to it, it's going to be. If God says a third and then a fourth of the remaining men in the, in the world are going to be killed, it's going to be. If God says demons are going to come up out of a pit to infiltrate this world, it's going to be. God has a perfect record in prophecy. He said to Adam and Eve, if you partake of that tree, you will die. And they did. He said the world would perish by water because of the sinfulness of man, and it did. He said that Babylon would fall, and it did. He said that Tyre would fall, and it did. He said Jerusalem would fall on one occasion, on several occasions, and it did. He said that Messiah would come and be born of a virgin, and he was. He said that Messiah would be born in Bethlehem, and he was. He said that Messiah would be slaughtered on a cross, and he was. So God is batting a thousand when it comes to prophecy. So when we come to the book of Revelation, we read something that is designed to remind us of what God is going to do, and we ought to have confidence, letter A. But letter B, we find, and we've already alluded to this, confidence in the return of Christ. Look at verse 7, 22 verse 7a, it says, And behold, I am coming quickly. Literally, the most imminent and relevant prophecy in Scripture is to those who say Christ is coming again. Christ is saying, I am coming quickly. I am coming quickly. It's not speaking of the speed of his coming as he travels to earth. It's, it's referring to the idea that he's coming very, very soon. Any natural reading of the New Testament yields the fact that the church believed that Jesus could come at any time. See, people have been thinking that, Christians have been thinking that for over 2,000 years. You say, well, then how could it be true? He says, I could come very, very, his, if, if his eminent return has been true for 2,000 years, then it really wasn't that eminent. But again, you and I don't, we think of time differently than God thinks of time. Um, eminency is what's really on the mind of anyone who reads, for instance, in Titus chapter 2, Paul says we are living, we are to be living righteously and godly in the present age. And then he says in Titus 2 verse 13, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. So Paul says in Titus 2 13, he says we're looking for the blessed hope, the appearing of Christ. Um, James chapter 5, verse 7. James says, Be patient, therefore, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. Be patient, strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is near. James says, back in approximately 50 A.D. It was near 2,000 years ago, and it's near today. Or in James chapter 5, the very next verse, he says, the judge is standing right at the door. Hmm. 1 John chapter 2, verse 28. John writes that you may have confidence and not shrink away from him in shame at his coming. In other words, I, we've given you this word so that you might not shrink in shame at his coming. 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. We know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. See, the church has always believed in the imminent return of Christ. 
that idea, as it affects me, causes me to draw near to him. When I forget this, and I still forget it, I get caught up with life, but as I'm reminded of this, I'm thinking, oh, uh, what, uh, what kind of life do I want to be living when he comes? Do, if, if I'm in, involved in some kind of sin at the moment of his coming, when I, for instance, for us, it will be the rapture, that will be a little embarrassing. That will be kind of a shameful thing. I don't want that to happen. I want to be drawing near to him, living righteously and holy before him. Uh, this assurance that we can expect him to fulfill his promise to return is a, has a holy effect on our lives. So I hope you're drawing near to him every day. I hope every day you're thinking, you know, this could be the day when we're raptured up to be with him. And in this whole, this whole chronology of the book of Revelation is going to be set into motion after the rapture and then the, the seven-year tribulation and then the millennium and all that is going to be set into motion. So point number one is, how does it affect my life? It builds my confidence in the imminence of Christ's return. But there's a second point. To increase our commitment to the instructions of Christ. You go back to chapter 22 of Revelation, verse 7, and he says, Blessed is he who heeds the words of the prophecy of this book. In other words, Christ is coming. The book of Revelation has been given to us so that we might have increased an increased level of commitment to the instructions of Christ. To heed, verse 7, to heed the words of the prophecy of this book. Now, there are propositional commands. What's a proposition? A proposition is simply a statement, a fact. Um, some people call the kind of preaching that we do here, they would call it propositional preaching. That's another term where we're stating facts. We're stating propositions. We're stating concepts. A proposition is simply something that is a fact. I say the grass is green. That's a propositional statement. That's a true one. But if I say 2 plus 2 equals 5, that's a propositional statement, but it's false. So a proposition is simply laying a concept or a statement, and you're preaching line upon line, precept upon precept, propositional statement upon pro and you get the idea of whatever the text is trying to say, and it has an impact on your life. So in light of the promise of Christ's coming, we have to be concerned about the contents of what he commands us to do, what he's told us to do. He says here in verse 7, Blessed is he who heeds the words of the prophecy of this book. And this brings back the statements of blessing for those who obey back in Revelation 1. You will be blessed if you obey. You will be blessed having heard it and read it and obey in it. That brings blessing. And so the emphasis is on the value of every part of the prophecy of this book. None of the words are wasted. None of the words are unimportant. The words of the prophecy of this book. There, there's lots of words in the book of Revelation. They're all designed to bring us blessing as we heed them, as we remember to, to uh, what he's going to do, or we remember to, to share these things with others and to tell them to repent because Jesus is coming back again. There's also a letter B, a practical compliance, because we've, as we've already said, you have to heed the words. Go back to 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 11 through 15, which we've looked at before, but I'll just share again at this point. 2 Peter chapter 3, 2 Peter, if I can find it, there's 1 John, 2 John, 2 Peter, here it is. Chapter 3, verse 11, where Peter writes, since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, he's talking about the destruction of the heaven and the earth. 
He says, since these things are destroyed this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, on account of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning, and the elements will melt with intense heat. But according to his promise, we are looking for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. And so there's this reminder that we ought to be a certain kind of people. There's a practical compliance. Because these things are to be, there ought to be a practical result. I heed, I obey. I look at my life and I say, Lord, is it in my where I should be yet. Uh, I grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ. I'm taking in his word. And I'm making changes by his grace and by his enablement to be what he wants me to be. There's a practical compliance. Over in 1 John chapter 5, there's another verse, 1 John chapter 5, verses 2 and 3. It says this, he says, By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and observe his commandments. How do you know you love God? Well, you observe his commandments. You can't say, I love God, and say, I don't care about his commandments. You can't say, I love God, and I don't, I don't give a rip about what he's commanded me to do. He says, for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome, 1 John 5, 3. See, the most important word, really, in my life is obedience. If you love me, Jesus says, you will keep my commandments. Revelation is not for our entertainment. Revelation ought to be, the book of Revelation ought to be for our motivation to obedience. These are the, this is what we ought to be. So there's a practical, there's a practical compliance to the propositional commands, to the commands of Scripture. We obey. We obey. So, a purpose of the book of Revelation is to increase our commitment to the instructions of Christ. Thirdly, it is to strengthen our compulsion to worship. It is to strengthen our compulsion to worship, verses 8 and 9. And we see in verse 8 the powerful impulse to worship. What happens here, John is getting this this talking to by this angel. And verse 8, he says, I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed me these things. Now, so John's so captivated and so caught up. I mean, if you have an angel come alongside you and explain to you the things that you, that you get from Revelation chapter 1, all the way through verse, chapter 22, that's going to be an overwhelming thing. I don't know if John received, I'm sure perhaps he didn't get it all in one go. I don't know. It, 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 it says that, you know, back in chapter 1, it was all on the Lord's Day. So it could have been a really long day for John. Maybe it was spread out over a little more time than that. I don't know. But John was captivated. He, this angel is speaking to him, and he's so overcome with the desire to worship, he falls down and worships the angel. Now, surely this is a mistake, because angels are not to be worshipped. This angel was simply quoting Jesus, and John is overwhelmed by the word of Jesus as it was being quoted by the angel, that he hits the deck and he worships the angel. What we do know is that it is the natural response of a follower of of Christ, that when they see Christ revealed, they fall down and worship him. I've often wondered what it's going to be like the day I pass from this life and I walk into the presence of Christ. Am I going to just immediately run and give him a hug? Am I going to do just jumping jacks for joy? Am I going to do happy somersaults? Or am I going to be on the deck? Uh, I remember when you're in the military, 
you walk into an office, you got to report to an officer. And uh, you don't just wander into the CEO's office, the CEO, the commanding officer. You don't just wander in his office like, like he's your best buddy. No, you walk in and, and initially they, they teach you, of course, things slack off over time, but you walk in and you say, you know, Private George F. reporting, sir. And you stand at attention until he says, stand at ease. And then you kind of, you can let down a little bit, but you're still there. He has your attention. He's watching you. And it's sort of similar uh, on a grander scale is that I walk into the presence of Christ and I'm standing at attention, although I may be on the deck, but in my mind I'm standing at attention. I'm worshiping him until he says, stand up, Dave, stand at ease. Stand at ease. And he has a word to say to me, whatever he wants to say. I, I kind of picture it like that. I will stand at ease when he gives me permission to stand at ease. And so, there's this powerful impulse to worship. John has heard the word of Christ, albeit from an angel, and he wants to worship. He's caught up. But not only that, letter B is the proper individual to worship, because the, look at verse 9. He says, And he, the angel, said to me, Do not do that. I am a fellow servant of yours and of your brethren, the prophets, and of those who heed the words of this book. Worship God. The angel reminds John, Look, 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 look. John, I'm not the guy you worship. Um, don't worship me. Don't worship me. It may be worship offered, you know, to Christ, but he's doing it in the presence of an angel. It looks like he's worshiping the angel. And so the instruction of the angel was to worship God and God alone. You find this in other places in Scripture where men begin to worship an angel. And uh, no, no, the angel backs away. No, don't, don't worship me. Worship Christ. Worship God alone. And so one, another point to remember as we look at the book of Revelation, it's going to strengthen our compulsion to worship Christ. It's all about Christ. It's You're seeing him in the most grand, the grandest, most glorious way in the book of Revelation, unlike any other book of the Bible. And so our hearts ought to have the impulse to worship him, even as John is worshiping him here. A fourth thing that we can derive as we a practical thing in looking at the book of Revelation is to open up communication through the preaching of Christ, verse 10. To open up communication through the preaching of Christ. Look at verse 10. And he said to me, Do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. The instruction, letter A, is to publish the revelation. The angel directs John to this book. He says, We are to keep the works of the prop the words of this prophecy of this book, but we are not to keep them for ourselves. Don't shut them up. Rather, we are to proclaim these words as wide as possible. To fail to proclaim these words is to fail God's promises, to fail his purposes, rather. Any Christian who fails to learn its truths is forfeiting blessing. Any preacher who fails to proclaim this book, and there's a lot of preachers, as I was, kind of afraid of the book of Revelation, but it's a book that needs to be preached and proclaimed today. People are afraid of this book, wrongfully so. It's a book that's to be published, to pronounce, to be proclaimed from the mountaintop. So there's the instructions to, to preach it, to publish it, is the idea here. Letter, but also the impact, we find the impact of the eminency of Revelation. This proclamation must possess a sense of urgency, for the time is near. 
Look at verse 10 again. For the time is near. We're back to the imminency of Christ's return. Uh, we do this. We communicate. And I have to be honest with you, this is something that, as I was reading just this portion here recently, you know, as I go about, I, I rarely ask a person, did you, I might do this, do you know that Jesus is coming again? I mean, everybody would admit to Jesus coming the first time. But what if I talk to some Tom, Dick, or Joe that's out there and say, you know, you believe that Jesus came the first time, right? Do you know that he's coming a second time? And you know what he's going to do? And, you know, that may be a, a good way to open up and get a person to think. By using the book of Revelation in my evangelistic outreach. Um, I have to admit I haven't done that. Um, but it, it's something that has crossed my mind. Because I see it opens up communication to preach Christ because he's coming soon. He's coming soon, for the time is near. The eminence of the return of Christ begs for the widespread preaching of the book of Revelation, proclaiming its truth. So we are, fourthly, to open up communication through the preaching of Christ. This book ought to encourage us to further communicate Christ to others. Number five is to comprehend the limited opportunity of people to trust Christ. Look at verse 11. Look at verse 11. You see two things here. You're going to find the results of the gospel rejected, but you're also going to see in verse 11 the results of the gospel received. There's two things there. The results of the gospel rejected, and secondly, the results of the gospel received. First of all, the results of the gospel rejected, let the one who does wrong still do wrong. And let the one who is filthy still be filthy. And let the one who is righteous still practice righteousness. And let the one who is holy keep himself holy. That sounds kind of odd to the ear especially the first part, why would he say that the one who does wrong still do wrong? Well, I mean, if you're going to continue to reject Christ, then all you have left is just to continue the course that you're on. Most will reject a call to repent, that is to change their minds. And the response to the proclamation of the truth of the gospel if they reject it, that will fix that will fix a person's eternal destiny. Worship, I've heard it explained this way, worship determines destiny. What you worship determines your destiny. Worship determines destiny. Everybody is a worshiper, by the way. Even the atheist is a worshiper. Even the agnostic is a worshiper. Every cultist is a worshiper. Everybody worships. It's who you worship that makes the difference. We worship Christ. We love Christ. We worship Christ. And because we worship him, that determines our destiny. And so he says, this, this is a reference here to the ultimate decision by men to reject God. If they reject God, they're left to their own demise. They're left to their own pursuits. So, hence, verse 11, let the one who does wrong still do wrong. Let the one who is filthy still be filthy. It's just stay there. If you go back to Romans chapter 1, again, we're familiar with this because we've talked about it before, but Romans chapter 1, well, beginning with verse 18, it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Men who reject Christ work real hard to suppressing the truth in their unrighteous acts, in their unrighteous pursuits. 
Because, verse 19, that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but became futile in their speculations, and their foolish hearts became darkened, professing to be wise they became fools and here it is they exchanged the glory of the incorruptible god for the image of the and form of incorruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures therefore god gave them over to the lusts of their hearts to impurity that their bodies might be dishonored god gave them over to all these lusts and pursuits then it says secondly down in verse 26 they, God gave them over to degrading passions. Then verse 28, God gave them over to a depraved mind. It says three times there in Romans 1, God gave them over. God gave them over. God gave them over to these various pursuits. God says, in other words, let him who is filthy just stay filthy. It's the wrath of God's abandonment, where God simply takes his hands off you and says, you want to pursue that direction here. Just go whole, whole hog. Go whole hog. And he takes his hands off and he abandons people to pursue their sin. It's, it's the wrath of abandonment. It's really a horrendous thing when you think about it. But on the other hand, at the end of verse 11, those who obey the gospel, those who are righteous and blessed because they receive Christ... It says there in verse 11 that the one who is righteous, who's that? The one who trusts Christ, still practice righteousness. You pursue righteousness. Let the one who is holy still keep himself holy. You keep on pursuing what you are. Keep your finger here and go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. Interesting verse here. He says, but Paul says, Thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ. He's talking about his ministry here. God leads us. Um, you know, we were reading yesterday of one man's, uh, in the, as Neil led a, our little men's study about a man who lives near Washington, D.C., who's a, Ken Burge, and uh, the things that God has allowed him to do. Just a small little church. And uh, as I think of this verse, I just now think of Ken. He says, thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. That's that's our ministry. Now, he, he talks about this Aroma. He says, for verse 15, for we are a fragrance or an aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. Interesting. We're an aroma to Christ. We're a fragrance of Christ. As you go about your life, Christian, you are fragrancing Christ to believers and unbelievers. You're fragrancing Christ to those who are saved and to those who are perishing. One fragrance it's going to have two different effects. Verse 16, to the one, an aroma from death to death, and to the other, an aroma from life to life. And who is adequate for this? I stop there. He says, we are an aroma or a fragrance of Christ. And to some, to the to believers, our fragrance in Christ, your fragrance in Christ to me is an aroma of life to life. We, we love that. But to others who are outside of Christ, the same aroma, the same fragrance brings about death because they reject Christ. Verse 17, he says, For we are not like the many peddling the word of God, but as from sincerity, but as from God, we speak in Christ in the sight of God. He says, we have this ministry of fragrancing Christ. It's going to have two separate, two distinct different results. So I go back to Revelation 22. And he says there, let the one who does wrong still do wrong. He's going to keep going the way he's going. He may smell Christ. You may, you may fragrance Christ to him, but he's going to keep on doing his wrong. 
But to those who love Christ, they're going to be drawn to that and they're going to continue in righteousness and holiness. And so we find here that there is a limited opportunity to fragrance Christ and the results of the gospel, there are going to be some who reject it and there are going to be some who receive it. But we have a limited time, a very limited time. That takes me to the last point this morning. The purpose of this book, in terms of what it should cause us to do, how it should impact us, is to that we be confronted with our accountability to Christ, verses 12 and 13. And you, we look at verse 12, you see the specifics of that accountability. He says, be, he says, Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to render to every man according to what he has done. So to be confronted with our accountability to Christ, and we find the specifics of that accountability there in verse 12, because Jesus repeats his warning that we must make ourselves ready because he's coming, and he's coming very, very soon. I'm coming quickly, he says. My reward is with me. And in coming, he declares that he will reward every man on the basis of their deeds The ungodly, as we saw back in chapter 20 at the great white throne of judgment, will be judged on the basis of their evil deeds. The books are open and their deeds are revealed. The godly will be judged on the basis of their their righteous deeds, not for salvation, but for reward. Go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 real quick here, because believers are going to receive a what we call a Bema seat judgment. B-E-M-A, the Bema seat, where we're standing before him and our works are evaluated. And it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9, Paul says, For we are God's fellow workers, and you are God's field, God's building. He says, According to the grace of God which was given to me, As a wise master builder, I laid a foundation, and another is building upon it. Let each man be careful how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, verse 12, he says, If any man builds upon the foundation with gold, silver, and precious stones, wood, wood, hay, and straw, each man's work will become evident. For the day will show it. The day will show it. There's a day of of evaluation is probably a better word than judgment. We're, we're going to be evaluated based on how we lived our lives as a believer. Verse 13, because it will be revealed with fire, and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which he has built upon remains, he shall receive a reward. He's talking about believers here. If any man's work is burned up, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet as through fire. There was a Bema seat judgment for believers. And and we are accountable. I will be judged on the things that I have done or not done, that I should have done, or the things that I did that I shouldn't have done. And... The quality of my works is described as wood, hay, or stubble. That's going to be burned up. That's no good. But if it's gold, silver, and precious stones, that will be that will last. Your works are equated to those either those combustible or non-combustible items. I'm sure a lot of what I've done is will be burned up. We can glory in the fact that. The Bible says, for believers, there is now therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. You'll never suffer condemnation. This is not to determine whether or not you'll be condemned. You will not be condemned if you're in Christ Jesus. But your works, or lack thereof, may be burned up and you will just not have the reward that you could have had. That's how it seems to pan out here in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 9 through 13, right in there. So there's, a, there's an accountability um, uh, to, to be mindful of. And there's other passages that talk about this. I think there's one over in 2 John chapter, 
That's 2 John 8. 2 John 8. There's only one chapter in 2 John. So 2 John verse 8. John says, watch your, the same guy who wrote the Revelation. John says, watch yourselves that you might not lose what we have accomplished, but that you may receive a full reward, 2 John 8. Just another side verse that kind of adds a little clarity to this. But so there's a, there are the specifics of accountability, but lastly here this morning, the, the standard of accountability is the Lord Jesus Christ because he finishes the statement in verse 13 that the standard for accountability is Christ Jesus himself. As you look at, go back to Revelation 22, verse 13, and this is what it says. He says in verse 13, he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. In other words, he declares in three different ways that he is the ultimate consummation of all things. He declares in three different ways that he is the ultimate consummation of all. I am the Alpha and the Omega. That's the first and last letter of the Greek alphabet. That's like saying A and Z. The first letter in the Greek alphabet is Alpha. The last letter in the Greek alphabet is Omega. That's like saying anything from A to Z. Not only that, he says in verse 13, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Jesus is the source of all and the goal of all, all things find their consummation in him. He is the standard of accountability. There are, there, there's going to be an accountability for all men, believers and unbelievers. Two different types of accountability. And the standard is Christ. And so the book of Revelation reminds us to be confronted with our ultimate accountability to Christ. Every person is accountable to Christ, even believers our works will stand before him to be tested. Again, not for our salvation, but for ultimate reward. There's going to be some kind of reward given to you or to me based upon our works. And I, I just sense that there's some little old lady out there who's lived for Christ and who's going to get a, a ton of rewards. And some of the great preachers you might hear on the radio may not get as much as you think they're going to get. <laughs> Well, I hope we get something, though, Judith. That's right. So God is the ultimate standard. Christ himself is the ultimate one who is, is the standard. So six things we've seen this morning in conclusion is that the book of Revelation ought to build our confidence in the imminence of Christ's return. That was number one. Number two, to increase our commitment to the instructions and commands of Christ. Number three, to strengthen our compulsion to worship Christ. Number four, to open up communication through the preaching of Christ. Number five, to comprehend the limited opportunity of people to trust on Christ. And number six, to be confronted with our accountability to Christ. The book of Revelation is a book that is immensely practical. It was never simply to be a book that just tickles our hearing and gives us some kind of weird entertainment, but it is to have an impact upon our lives. I trust that it's been impactful for you. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, thank you for your grace and thank you for your word. I pray, Lord, that you would take these thoughts and the things that have been shared and make them meaningful to us, that we would be changed. Lord, that we would not be the same people that we were even when we came this morning. Help us, Lord, to cling to you in these days where there's trouble and turmoil, where there's scandal, where there are grossness of sin at every level. Thank you, Lord, that you've given us your truth, which is really the most precious commodity that exists today. Help us to cling to it and to love it, to embrace it, to preach it and to proclaim it. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.